Welcome to the EVs with Kaz podcast. Each episode is a conversation with someone who drives an EV on a regular basis. Let's hear from today's guest. Hey everyone, welcome to the EVs with Kaz podcast. Today I have a special guest because he has a vehicle unlike any other so far. This is Blaine. Hello. Thanks. <laughs> so Blaine, you this is your first electric vehicle, right? Yes. What is it? This is the Energica Ego, uh, the RS model. It's a fully electric sport bike. And yeah, it's something I've been I've been thinking about for a long time, but uh, in this this year was the first time that it became it became an option for me. So mm -hmm. yes. So what made you go electric? Uh, you know, I've, I've had my eye on electric motorcycles for a long time. I've, I've been riding bikes for, for about 15 years. I've been riding motorcycles. And so as EV culture has become more prevalent with, with cars, I've always wondered what's going on with the electric scene. And I've been asking that constantly and constantly. And, and there are a couple of companies I've been keeping my eye on over the last few years but nothing has been affordable really in, until this year or maybe maybe the last couple of years. So, so really, uh, it's something I would have done a long time ago. But um, yeah, there's, there's a couple major things that had to happen first. And one of them was the cost and the other ones we'll, we'll probably get into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then so I think, is, is this your only mode of transportation that you own? Yes. Yeah, I sold my truck back in 2017, and ever since then, yeah, my, my bike has been my primary mode of transportation. But even when I owned a truck, really, motorcycle has been my primary mode of transportation for, I mean, really since 2007 when I started riding. Is that just because that's all you need kind of thing, or it's more fun? Or yeah, Well, both, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, I, my lifestyle is such that everywhere I go for work, there's typically already equipment there that I need to work with. I'm not typically moving equipment or people around. So yeah, when I started riding motorcycles, I, I realized that I could really just do this primarily. And uh, it's, it's only cost effective if you have the right kind of bike, which I never had. I've always had sport bikes. It's not more cost effective I think than just having a small car but yeah. it is um, it is fun it's a lifestyle choice there's a kind of efficiency that I enjoy and that I'm proud of I'm sure you felt this way before I, I I'm on the freeway a lot and I see a lot of people driving cars that can seat five or six people and there's always only ever one person in it yeah. You know, if, if, if everybody was in a smaller car or on a motorcycle and only used a larger vehicle when they needed it, it just seems like it would be a more efficient world. So I'm, that, that's something that I'm, I'm proud to be living. Yeah. For electric cars, in my experience, I've had two experiences going to a dealership to get an electric car. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically every time the, the person I was talking to didn't know a whole lot about the electric car. Mm -hmm. How was your buying experience with this? Oh man, uh, I have to give massive props to the uh, the Energica Motor Company. So Energica is this still kind of small-ish um, electric uh, motor company from Italy. And what happened was when I was looking for what electric bikes were on the market, there was really only three options for me. It was Damon, it was Energica, and it was uh, Zero. Or Livewire, actually, but Livewire just didn't have anything, um, the kind of design I was looking for. I was really looking for a sport bike. Mm. Uh, I've been riding R6s almost this entire time. I've had three bikes, R6S, <laughs> R6, R6. So, uh, you know, sport bikes, 600 range are what I'm used to. Basically, I chose Energica because out of those three companies, Zero, Energica, and Damon, Energica was the company that was really responsive when I had questions. I, I hit them up on their website. I sent them emails. I got a call back from their their head of sales for North America. This is you know that that's kind of how 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 much attention they they uh, give to people who are trying to learn about their bike. So I, I really appreciated that. That that made a big difference. And they have continued to be responsive and helpful throughout the process. This is my first electric vehicle ever. So within the first couple of weeks, I had a massive list of questions. Uh, John Luca, the guy who, who handles their 
their kind of PR and, and stuff like that, I was able to call him up and we had this hour long discussion of, of going through all my questions. What is, you know, when wow. do I charge it? How much do I charge it? What's the deal with these modes? You know, what is it actually changing? Like I, I understood how the bike worked. I wanted to know more about what was going on behind the curtain and they were really responsive. They, they just kept being excited about answering questions about the bike. So that, that's, that has made me feel very secure and, and, and um, happy with my, with my purchase. Yeah, that's awesome. That's the like, complete opposite of my experience <laughs> where people yeah, don't know yeah. and, and kind of don't care. I've heard for the car world, people trying to get electric vehicles and the, the dealership actually trying to convince them not to buy the electric vehicle and to buy a comparable gas Right, um, right. Well, they've got stock they've got to get rid of. They've yeah. got gas cars they've got to they've got to sell and unload. And yeah, I'm assuming. I don't right. Know. And so this company, they only sell electric motorcycles here. Is that do you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Energica, as far as I know, that's that's what they do. Is they're making electric motors. Mm -hmm. um, and I've only, I'm pretty sure they only make electric motorcycles. But I could be wrong. Uh, Energica people, if you're listening to this, sorry. You know, I, I <laughs> no, and I think that makes a big difference too. I think that's part of the thing with Tesla is they know electric cars because that's all they do. Right. Um, right. So I think I think that's a pro for sure. <sighs> it's benefit. it's it's a pro in one sense. The one thing I feel I should be honest about though too is what I was what I was really waiting for, and the future I'd still like to see is for motorcycle companies that already have huge production lines and systems in place for making and selling motorcycles embracing ev culture like if that happened i think that would be good for everybody and we're seeing that in the ev world i mean tesla is is a success story but i, I feel like it could just as easily have failed it was really volatile in the beginning right mm -hmm. now that we're seeing major car companies pivot towards doing ev stuff i feel like that gives people a sense of security you know this company is going to be around this company knows how to sell cars and deal with cars but as you point out they may not be interested in ev culture and, and they may not there's probably a lot that they don't know about ev cars specifically and mm -hmm. so you see a company like tesla yeah maybe they have a huge advantage because they're you know they're starting from the ground up from first principles build electric cars and they've got none of the dead weight of the old technology so so i don't know i i, I would like to see larger motorcycle manufacturers pivot in this direction too because mm -hmm. there, there's a kind of benefit that comes with that also having an established company and, and having that consistency yeah yeah i agree i wonder if it's a thing with cost you know like they have all their tooling all that stuff geared towards engines gas powered engines and it's gonna have yeah. to be a completely different uh assembly line i don't know i don't know it's personnel too. It, it's investment in personnel. You, you've you got all this money, you've invested in this infrastructure. A company like Yamaha is not going to, is not going to lay off hundreds of people that are perfectly good at selling internal combustion engines to make way for an EV movement mm -hmm. that they're not convinced is going to be a real thing, right? It takes a long time to steer that that ship in a different direction, right? Yeah. So that's the benefit of small companies that they, they can just move and, and change direction Many of them fail, but mm. it, yeah, every once in a while you get a Tesla, and that's the su success story that survives, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So let's see, how so far has the transition been going from gas to electricity? So we can see now Blaine's actually charging his bike, <laughs> so he has a place to charge. Um, yeah, how's that transition been? Uh, I think having the ability to charge at home makes or breaks the experience. If I had to go out and charge somewhere else, it would be a, a major pain in the ass. Um, uh, it would, it would. I've, I've charged out in the world maybe four times now in three months, and it's not bad. It's not an awful experience, but it is longer than filling up a tank of gas. It is harder to find a charging station. Some of them aren't working, even though they're listed, and the apps that I use to find charging stations are pretty good about keeping that updated, they'll let you know, hey, we haven't heard from this particular charging station, so just be aware it might not be functioning. If I didn't have the option to just come home and plug it in every time I come home, it, it would be a more difficult lifestyle. So mm -hmm. I think that's an important thing to be honest about. Yeah. Um, also, having the range that you need to get to where you're going and be able to get back home is important. I think it is 
a major load off to just know that I'm going to be able to get home and not have to worry about it. So that has been an adjustment. Um, I don't miss gas stations. That's, um, <laughs> yeah, it's weird. It's weird to think that I haven't just been to a gas station now in like three months. Yeah. Yeah. What, um, what apps are you using for finding charging spots? Charge point has been my go-to. Um, I especially like that. It's been true with every charging station. You can just use a credit card. Like you don't have to have an account with that particular charging station or whatever, you know, but they do have apps. The charge point app so far has been really good about finding charging stations, even that are not the charge point brand, uh, charger. They'll pull up Tesla chargers. They'll pull up EVgo chargers. EVgo is the second one that I've used, um, less frequently, Mm. but yeah, I haven't I haven't really had to do that a lot so far. Mm. Yeah. So it looks like right here are you you're using a 110 plug to charge. 110 plug, it's a 21.5 kilowatt battery. If it's close to zero, it'll take from 8 to 10 hours to do that charged to 100% mm. on the 110 plug. This is the slowest you can possibly do it. Um, from what I understand, it's it's the best for the life of the battery to do slower, cooler charging that isn't overheating it. But I would like to eventually have a a proper charge point station um, installed at home so I could do it faster if I wanted to. What's your like daily commute like? Do you have a daily commute? And if so, how far is that? I do. Uh, I always go eight miles to work and eight miles back on a typical workday. Three or four times a week, I'll go a 60-mile round trip to rehearsal, about. So those are the ones that made me nervous. That That's the first couple times I went. It's from here to Torrance is my longest drive, typical commute drive. Those are the ones where I was really paying attention and paying attention to how I was driving and how much charge do I have when, when I get back. And, and so far, that's been, it's been no problem. I've been able to ride pretty much comfortably how I normally would, and I'm able to get home easily at like 30%. I'll still be at 30% about. Nice. So, yeah. Um, have you encountered any range anxiety yet? Uh, yeah, initially, of course. Mm. That that was, I mean, you make a purchase like this. Yeah, the worst thing that can happen is you find out that it's not going to work out, right? <laughs> I, this was... This is the first new vehicle I've ever purchased. That, mm. that made me really nervous. I've usually, I've purchased used bikes, bikes with miles on them already. Um, so yeah, I did not want to find out in the first two weeks that I wouldn't be able to get to rehearsal and come home and charge my bike and have it at 100% the next morning. If that wasn't true, if that couldn't happen, it would have been, it would have been pretty, pretty bad news. Uh-huh. So. Um, and to be honest, there's still some difficulty sometimes where if I get home really late from rehearsal and then I'm up at 7 a.m. the next day, it might not get to 100 by that time. I've, I've had to cut the, I've had to set the cutoff limit to like 90% so that it doesn't go into um, balancing. Once it goes into balancing, apparently it's, it's, not a good, uh, it's not a good idea to interrupt it at that point. And that can take like 30 to 40 minutes. So, so there, yeah, there have been a few days where... Um, I had to just be aware of that. But so far now, I bought it in October. It's late December now. I've done all of the normal commuting that I will ever do. Um, I I basically have reached a point now where I don't think about it. I I know that I can get to where I'm going. I know that I can ride as aggressively or or calmly as I want, and I'll probably still be fine by the time I get home. So that's, that's been great. That's been important. Yeah. yeah, I think that's something that maybe isn't talked about or maybe I don't know if other people experience this because for me, w- once I kind of learn my vehicle, yeah. I know m- about how far it can go, whether yeah. that's in, in gas or electricity or whatever. Because yeah. like, I, I think it's probably the same, was the same with your R6 where you didn't have a gas gauge. Is that right? Right. 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 So like, yeah. in, you know, those of you that don't know with motorcycles, a lot of them don't have gas gauges. So right you kind of get to know your bike and like how far you can go on a tank of gas. Yeah. I don't know if that was an advantage for me going to EVs, but uh, I didn't, I haven't really encountered range anxiety much at all, really. Um, Interesting. Because like, yeah, once you get to know your vehicle, at least in my case, it's, yeah. you, you just kind of know. 
Yeah, with motorcycles, it's the worst too because there's there's not a gauge, but there is a light that comes on and just says, hey, you've got this much <laughs> gas left and you start to learn, okay, that means I've got this many miles or this many miles depending on how fast I'm going right now. So on, on my last R6 too, this poor 2012 R6 had so many electrical problems. The fuel sensor at some point stopped working. Mm. So at least three or four times on that bike, I just the fuel light came on and that actually just meant, no, you're done now, <laughs> you're done now. You've got one or two more miles and it was just malfunctioning. So yeah, I got to know that bike really well uh, on how far it could go on, on you know 4.5 gallons or whatever. So I expect it'll be the same for this one. Um, I don't know if it's a product of it being a smaller battery comparatively to EV cars, but I do think it is more susceptible to a, a, a bigger difference between aggressive and more casual riding. Mm. You, I have felt the difference you know, between a 60 mile commute going mostly 80 and one going through traffic where I'm humming along at 50. Like it, it does make a big difference. So let's see, you mentioned uh, balancing the cells. Yeah. And so we, Blaine and I had talked about this earlier. Uh, he was actually gracious enough to let me try his uh, motorcycle, which is yeah. awesome. Yeah, that's um, right. And uh, so you, your battery is actually a lithium polymer battery, mm -hmm. whereas a lot of EVs on the market these days are lithium ion, or there's some that are uh, lithium ion, iron phosphate, something. Uh, yeah, so I'm wondering, I don't know if you've looked into any further. I, I kind of researched it a little bit, but yeah. I didn't get the answer to this question because I don't think for the lithium ion batteries, we have that balancing thing where you're not supposed to unplug. Um, I wonder if that's your battery chemistry thing. Or... There's there's a lot of stuff. And I, I also did not know the difference between the lithium uh, types, mostly just because it wasn't an option available to me anyway. It's not like there were 12 EV sport bikes that I wanted to get, but some of them, you know, I wasn't really diving deep into the, the differences between the battery types. It, it really just came down to, you know, what's available, what company do I like, and which one of these bikes would I be happy with, and when can I get it, you know? So, yeah, the fact that this was a lithium polymer battery, I didn't even know that until you brought that up. <laughs> you know, I, I'm sure I saw it many times looking mm -hmm. over the specs, but what I was surprised to hear, and now this is making sense, when I talked to to their sales guy, um, John Luca, I asked him about all of the things that you hear people say about lithium ion batteries in general. You know, you hear people say stuff like, don't let it sit at a low percentage. Don't let it sit at 100%. You don't want to charge it up all the time. You want it to live around 80. You don't want to charge it up to 100% really frequently. You don't want it to get hot. Like there's this zeitgeist of EV just battery culture that I think also is infected a little bit by what we're used to regarding our phones and our laptops. And you hear this is a an EV car with a lithium battery, and I think some people just assume the same rules apply. A lot of the questions that I asked Energica about this battery, they seem to make it sound like, oh yeah, a lot of that doesn't apply mm -hmm. because either this is the size of the battery that it is, or uh, be maybe because it's a lithium polymer, but they didn't tell me that specifically, and now I'm wondering if that's the case. Mm -hmm. But a, a lot of my initial concerns, they kind of made it sound like, oh yeah, that's not, the, you know, the, for whatever reason, they weren't concerned with that. I don't mm -hmm. know. Maybe that's just in their best interest as a marketing tactic to not, uh, uh, to downplay potential problems. But mm -hmm. I, I've, I've gotten very honest answers from them, and I feel like they would have they would have brought that up if that's something they knew about. So maybe that has something to do with it. The fact that it's lithium polymer might exempt it from some of those common issues you hear about. But it sounds like one restriction that that you weren't aware of or that some people aren't aware of is yeah, it, the bike is very specific about saying, look, when you get to about 95%, it's going to start the balancing process. Once you start the balancing process, you don't want to disconnect it. You want to let it finish. And that has been anywhere from, like I said, 30 to 40 minutes long. It can stay at 98% for 30 minutes, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that that is, I think, the biggest roadblock and kind of danger right now for mm -hmm. me is making sure that it doesn't go into that balancing mode when I'm, I might need it soon. And I think you mentioned it, but you can limit your charge so that mm -hmm. it doesn't get to that spot. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and that's pretty useful. They also have a, a long period rest mode. 
because apparently if, if you just let it sit for months and months like some people you know they they'll they'll buy a motorcycle and they really only ride it seasonally mm-hmm. um yeah if you don't keep it plugged in and 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 maintained every once in a while it can it can damage the battery so they they have a long period rest mode in there i don't think i'm ever going to use it mm-hmm. I'm, I'm on this thing almost every day so no ev culture is is growing Maybe it'll hit some bumps. Do you feel that this is an inevitable slide? Do you think that the the people who are out there that are really fighting against this or are just total naysayers, what do you think is going to happen ultimately with this? Is is are a hundred percent of the vehicles on the road going to be electric at some point? Are we going to find a different technology? Is are we going to settle in the middle somewhere? Like what what do you think is going on? With this culture right now i think eventually in the end everything will be electric i think it's going to take quite a while to get there yeah but i think because the electric motor is so versatile with what it can accept as its energy source mm. i think that's going to be the way to go so maybe we have full battery electric yeah maybe yeah. we have some hydrogen fuel cell for some things maybe we have solid state batteries maybe it's solar yeah like it can be all sorts of combinations of things but i think it's basically just the electric motor and then we're going to find different ways to power those motors I that's think. see i'm glad i asked because that's fascinating i think that's an excellent point yeah the electric motors here to stay whether or not it's dependent on a on a lithium battery or a battery of any kind specifically yeah that's who knows and and honestly that's the that's the least interesting part about it to me when I think about why I was interested in EVs, there's there's two things that come to mind. And the first one is general pollution, not only on the wide scale, but just on the local scale. When you're when you're on a freeway, you notice this especially when you're on a motorcycle. You are surrounded by cars with exhaust pipes. You can smell it in the air, you can smell the brake dust, you can smell the exhaust. It it's a very real part of the experience. And so oftentimes when people have the criticism of environmental waste from batteries, from electric vehicles being just as much as the pollution brought on, the air pollution by combustion engines, you can get into the details of whether or not that's even true. But for me, I feel like centralizing the waste and the exhaust to electric power plants that are still relying on fossil fuels to generate electricity on the grid is still an improvement that I would take over outsourcing the pollution to rural centers and city centers and where people are living, right, in aggregate. Mm -hmm. That's still worse. It's worse to have a bunch of combustion engines where people are breathing. If you outsource all the combustion, I mean, never mind that that a power grid can have wind and solar helping and then burning fossil fuels to, to supplement the rest, that's still, that's still pollution that's centralized in one place away from where most people are living, right? That's an improvement. As far as I'm concerned, if 50 years from now, 60% of the cars on the road are electric motors instead of combustion engines, that's an improvement. I'll take it. I don't think it even has to be 100% for this movement to make sense, mm-hmm. right? So that that's... Really, this is just me responding to a, a straw man that doesn't exist somewhere. Some person who just like really wants combustion <laughs> yeah. engines. And I get it. I get it. You know, one thing I think it's important to be honest about too is that I didn't like how on my R6, I had to be loud. I had to be 10 to 14,000 RPMs to access the kind of torque that I wanted. It's fun but you're just immediately an asshole to everybody around you. Nobody likes loud cars (laughs) zipping past them, right? Right. So that's all here on the electric bike, but I gotta be honest, it's kind of fun to feel the vibration and for it to be, for there to be a loud response to something that you're doing. I'm undecided still as to whether or not I miss that. I would like to go and ride a leader bike somewhere, rent an R1 for the day or something to experience that again, to see if that's something that I really miss. Cause that's the one thing that I noticed right away. It is scary and eerie to be on this thing going like 80, 90 miles an hour, feeling the torque of what the engine's giving you. And the wind noise is the loudest thing. Mm. I mean, it's slippery. It's, it's, it's just, 
fast, you can set it up so that there's no uh, regenerative braking, so that you're just you're maintaining all of that when you when you let off the throttle, and that's awesome. It's really really fun to control. It's also a fundamentally different experience, and so. I want to live in a world where people have access to combustion engines if they really want them. I just get the feeling that just like people who mostly use their cars to just get to work, there will be mostly people who just use EVs to get to work because they don't care about the kind of car they're driving. Mm -hmm. I think if you're really excited about a combustion engine and feeling and hearing the response of a vibrating motor, cool. Uh, you know, Odds are the amount of people for whom that's true, it is not some critical amount of people that are still gonna, you know, mess up the planet and and mess up the air quality. Like that's fine. Just you know, it, it'll exist in places where people are really passionate about those mm -hmm. things. So yeah, I've heard the comparison of uh, horses. Yeah, like if yeah. you know the the gas combustion engine will probably be around for a really long time, and mm -hmm. it'll be one of those things like. Horse people. If you really like horses, if you love riding horses, you can. Like, yeah. you can own a horse. I've seen um, somewhere around LA, not like the central LA, but LA County, yeah. people riding horses on the sides of streets. Mm -hmm. um, probably be the same for gas. If you're really yeah. enthusiastic about it, if you can find somewhere to get gasoline, yeah, you can probably still have. <sighs> yeah, that that I'm I'm sympathetic to that problem because I think the sad thing will be that. If you really like combustion engines, like that's cool. You can have one for as long as you want, but gasoline is going to get insanely expensive. It's going to get really expensive. It'll be hard to find, and it'll be expensive when you can find it. And you know that's unfortunate. I think if if you're really passionate about those things, you know that's a very real future. That if I was if I was an internal combustion engine enthusiast, that's the reality that I would be trying to fight against. Is mm -hmm. gas is going to get expensive? Mm -hmm. You know, with electric cars, mm -hmm. uh, maintenance is pretty minimal. Like right. we're usually uh, tire rotation, windshield wiper fluid. Um, in the two EVs that I've had, the Leaf and the Bolt, mm -hmm. um, a, a brake fluid flush every year or two. It's actually mm -hmm. more frequent than gas-powered engines, so I'm not quite sure why. Uh, but other than that, there's not a whole lot of maintenance. How about with this bike? Do you know what's the schedule, what you're supposed to do? Uh, just like any other bike, tires, chain, brake pads is going to be exactly the same as it's ever been. Um, there is an initial checkup on the engine at 600 miles, at the first 600 miles. Mm. There is a kind of transmission fluid. This is, I'm so embarrassed still that I haven't figured this out or not, I haven't understood this fully. There is a kind of fluid in this motor. Um, they call it transmission fluid, but there's no gears. So I don't know. I don't know if it's just, I, I don't understand how the, the um, how the torque is shifting from one range to another and why that requires transmission fluid. I, mm. I don't know. Maybe they just use that term, but it doesn't like apply in a direct way way. Mm -hmm. Point is, that is the maintenance that needs to be checked up on every once in a while, but that's every, oh God, I think it's like 16,000 miles or something. I'm going to get that wrong. Sorry, <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember. It's, it is a very large number to where I don't have to think about it. Mm -hmm. And it even, it says on the bike too, it'll, it'll remind you when that time is coming up. It keeps track of the next um, service date, nice. um, service mileage and everything. So that, that's an important thing to consider, though, because that did go into the equation of whether I should buy an electric vehicle. I, I ran the numbers over and over again, and basically what it comes down to is Energica even themselves doesn't know yet how many miles these motors will last. Mm. They have people out there who have brought them up to, I think, 60 at this point, but they don't know. They know probably how many life cycles the, the battery will have, how many cycles that can survive. Mm. But if, as far as I'm concerned, if this bike can survive more than about 50,000 miles or last me five years, at that point, it'll be outperforming the combustion engine bikes that I've had mm. regarding maintenance costs and everything. Um, the problem with the EV bike is all of the costs are up front. So you get rid of the maintenance costs, basically. You get rid of the gas cost. It, it takes like $2 to charge this thing to full. So the, the gas cost is basically just out the window. But it's a more expensive bike up front. This bike was, uh, I think, 
MSRP is like 26,000. Mm. And it's basically a leader bike. The, the way it performs, the kind of power it has, uh, it, it's around that power, if not more. I think an R6, an, uh, sorry, a new R1 is probably like 16, maybe, God, oh. maybe like 18,000 at this point. Mm. Oh, Yamaha got expensive really fast. What happened, guys? I, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I started checking at one point. I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think R6s are like 14,000 now. It's kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. So, so point is, yeah, you, you could buy a cheaper combustion engine now, and then over the course of five years, you'll spend money on gas and a lot more frequent maintenance. Or you could spend more money on an EV now, and if it outlasts the lifespan of that combustion bike, it will have already paid itself off, paid off the difference in that sense. So mm-hmm. that that's the risk I'm taking. And, and honestly... You know, I'm nervous about that. I would have preferred not to have spent this much money up front. Like I said, I'm not used to it. This is a new vehicle for me. This is the first time I've ever purchased a new vehicle. I would have felt a lot safer just purchasing a used vehicle. But, you know, that's just my own inexperience. Apparently, a lot of people do that. They buy <laughs> new cars. I just, I've just never been part of that world. So, yeah, that, that's kind of how the numbers have played out. And, and that was an important factor for me in making this decision. You know, I could have just bought another R6 somewhere. But, you know, this, this was possible for me now. So let's see, you've had the bike for about three months so far. Yeah. Um, do you, have you had it long enough to have any sort of favorites or dis, dislikes also with this thing? Uh, <clears throat> favorites has got to be the, the torque availability. It's, it's absurd. It's really strange. I, the first thing I noticed when I rode the, the Ego here was the kick you get from 0 to 40 is the same as the kick you get from 70 to 90, mm-hmm. 90 to 100. Like It's just always available. That's pretty exciting. It's fun. It's mm-hmm. fun to be able to, to do that. Uh, I love how smooth it is. The throttle is extremely responsive. And when you're, when you're taking turns and, and, um, you know, I went up into the Santa, uh, Santa Monica mountains recently. And when you put on like a high regenerative braking response on the throttle, this is start and stop, go and brake all in one spot. And so it, it becomes a really kind of fluid, fun motion the, the control over the bike is simple and responsive and a high resolution. That's pretty cool. I, I've never felt that with the combustion engine. Um, it's a lot more work on a combustion engine to be shifting gears to, in order to get that, right? Mm-hmm. It takes work to get into the right gear at any given moment to get to where you are, are accessing that torque. So that's cool, um, which connects to one of my um, one of my least favorite things it seems kind of silly but i i don't know if you experienced this with evs in cars as well um it almost feels like it's too easy Hmm. and you've lost a sort of um you had a skill which was i have the skill of managing a combustion engine through six different gears on two wheels and now that skill has been made more available to everybody. It's probably just how people felt when automatic transmissions became a thing. Mm-hmm. And everybody who knew how to shift and drive a manual shift car probably kind of felt like, oh, well, <laughs> that thing that I was really good at, nobody needs it anymore. That's kind of how I feel with this bike. Is mm-hmm. Sometimes it's almost, it's almost too easy. And I spent 10 years learning how to you know, maneuver these, these particular kinds of motors, and now it just doesn't matter. So. Mm-hmm. Um, I would have said my least favorite thing about the battery culture was just managing charging and everything, but in this amount of time now, it's like like we said earlier, it's become kind of a non-issue. Um, yeah, I love the design. To be very honest, I'm kind of a sucker for good design. Mm-hmm. In my opinion, sorry, Energica, um, the R6, the the 20, I think like 2008 to mm-hmm. 20. 22, I guess, now was the last R6 they made. Um, it's expertly designed bike. Excellent. Like, not only just mechanically, but just visually. I thought mm-hmm. it was uh, just beautiful. So, um, yeah, that's one of my favorite things about about the, the Eco here that, that Energica makes. Is just It looks like it was designed by somebody who was just trying to make a sport bike and not by somebody who was trying to make an electric bike. I don't know if you've noticed, but mm-hmm. there's some EV bikes that just look like they're trying to do something different. Like, remember when the hybrid came out? 
the mm -hmm. uh, the um, the Prius. The Prius. Uh -huh. the Prius. Yeah, yeah. The Prius looked like it had been designed specifically to look like something different as mm -hmm. a kind of statement, a cultural statement. You know, I feel like there's a lot of EV bikes that are like that right now, where mm -hmm. they're they're saying, "All right, it's a different kind of motor. So what can we do differently with the design?" It's you don't need to do anything different with the design. Like mm -hmm. it's most combustion engine motorcycles already are designed very, very well for what they're doing. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I appreciate that about this bike too. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it is, a, it is a good looking bike. Yeah, I always wanted uh, an R6 actually for the same reason. I thought the Yamaha bikes looked the best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I get this from my dad. I just recently was talking to him about cameras. My dad collects cameras now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he sometimes buys cameras just because they look cool. Mm -hmm. And I think I wanted an yeah. R6 because it looked cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, this, this is a really nice looking bike. Um, how about the weight? Have you, has that taken a bit to get used to? Yeah, yeah, thanks for reminding me, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, I mean, for one, I've been on 600s this whole time. This is, is, God, I forget exactly how much. It's something like 70 pounds heavier than mm -hmm. an R6. Um, something absurd like that. Uh, and it is heavier than most bikes of its size, right? So that's that's definitely a thing that you have to get used to. I don't know whether I would put that on a like a list of least favorite things because once you get moving, it doesn't matter. And this this bike has excellent braking on it too. The, I don't know if you like these, the brake pads in the front are absurdly large. I know that kind of adds to the weight a little bit, but mm -hmm. the braking is extremely responsive. I've also never had a bike with um, an anti-lock braking system mm. before. That comes in handy. Yeah. So it's heavy, but stopping has been much better than I've ever been able to stop on an R6. I, uh, with the, the back wheel on my r6 was always fishtailing i was always having to kind of actively pump the back brake you know um so the weight doesn't matter in that sense where it does matter is very slow maneuvering i have almost dropped this bike at least twice now just taking really slow turns you know off a curb down a ramp uh trying to park it somewhere taking a right turn and having to make an unexpected break. I almost dropped it because I mm. just, my weight wasn't, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, so that is, yeah, it's, it's an issue. Apparently it's an issue um, that they have addressed at least a few times now. The, mm. the first Ego model, I think back in, what was it? I think it was 2017 or something. They've, they've been building these for a while. They just haven't been like available or, or certainly not at this price range. Um, they have addressed that a few times over. The batteries have gotten lighter, the engine have gotten lighter. Um, so the the weight is something that I think people should know about. Mm. This bike is heavier than it looks. Mm -hmm. That's it. You just have to know that going in. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I feel like it's distributed pretty well. For me, for my mm -hmm. height, when I rode it, it's a bit tall for me. Um, I was kind of on my tiptoes. Mm -hmm. So that I, I'm used to more being able to flat foot things. Uh, yeah. When I did the tested the Livewire one too, it's the seat. You know, it's not a it's a more of a cruiser type bike. Mm -hmm. um, but though, yeah, once you get going, it kind of kind of just disappears. Yeah. Really, if there was a different power source, what do you think it's going to be? If it's not lithium batteries, or oh, like a storage, yeah, a storage source. Yeah. Um, the thing that seems to be on the horizon soon is solid state batteries. Mm -hmm. I don't know a ton about it. Okay. Um, but I think they're supposed to be safer, so less likely to catch on fire for whatever reason. Yeah. Safer, lighter, and I think more energy dense. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, I don't know. I don't know what the far future holds. I'm, I'm aware of the difference between a hard drive and a solid state drive. I was under the impression that a battery is already a solid state. Uh, like, are there a lot of moving parts in a battery? I, no. I I've never heard that. But I think it's with, there's some sort of like, <laughs> I'm going to get comments about this being like, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. There's some sort of, uh, I wouldn't, I don't know if it's like liquid. Um, it's maybe a gel or something in the lithium ion batteries. Uh -huh. And I believe solid state batteries are completely dry. Okay. I could be completely wrong about that. 
so better batteries. Yeah, is better what, batteries. Is what is going to be okay? Yeah, right. more energy dense and lighter. I okay. Think. Well, for whatever chemistry or whatever that is, I think that's the way. Whatever. You know. What happened to the battery swapping thing? I thought there were stories about companies working on like battery swapping stations and yeah. stuff like that. Like, but that seems like that would solve a major problem, right? Yeah. To just hop, drive into a. a and whatever gas station or whatever and just and flip it out if it's even if it's a five minute process that's mm -hmm. better than having to sit and charge your your ev what happened to that i i'm assuming it was a lot harder than people were thinking it would be mm -hmm. because i think from what i i've seen things about this there is a company or was a company out there that was doing it for a few different models okay but you had to like retrofit your battery to be able to change at their station. Yeah. So I think the problem is standardizing either the battery yeah. size or however it links up into the car. I think yeah. that's the problem. So God. it would be great if you could just roll in and then, you know, the machine takes out your battery, puts in a new one. Yeah. That'd be awesome. But yeah, I think it's just people need to settle on some kind of standard and that's probably... That stuff takes so long happen. too. I feel like a lot of people don't appreciate how much time it took to even agree on industry standards for gas and, mm. and combustion engines. Mm -hmm. and what, what octane level? Leaded, unleaded? What, how large are these, uh, uh, how large are the tanks at gas stations allowed to be? Uh, how large is the, is the nozzle? Mm -hmm. you know, where do you put a gas, uh, your gas cap on a car so that it's easy to, I've noticed there's been some disagreement with EV vehicles about like which side where the charger should be should mm -hmm. be on the side of the vehicle on the front of the vehicle you know yeah on this bike i feel like it's a little weird that it seems like they really want you to be charging from the right side of the bike even though you get off on the left side uh, like the the key to open the charging uh the cap is on the right side and the 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 connector is is facing from the right mm -hmm. side and mm -hmm. i wonder if they did that because most people sidle up to a curb and the chargers on the right side of the curb, mm. maybe, right? But I feel like with bikes, it's kind of, you people don't park bikes parallel to curbs. They park them this way. So anyway, mm -hmm. I, I wonder, I wonder, Yeah. a question for Energica Motor <laughs> Companies. Why did you feel like riders need to be on the right side of the bike to, to charge it? I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. yeah, yeah, it's still, still in the early days. If, for me, it feels weird because I've been riding or, or driving EVs since 2014. Mm -hmm. But I think the percentage of American cars or cars in America that are electric, I think uh, the statistics were weird, but the last I saw, I think it was like 1% of yeah. the vehicles are electric right now. So mm -hmm. we're still in the very early stages. Yeah, we got ports in the front, ports on the side, driver's side, passenger side. Yeah, I think there's maybe one that's in the back. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. it's still It's still very much the wild west out there of, of yeah, what, what standards are. And I, you know, that's, that's a risk. That's the thing about this that I hate the most is I don't, I don't, as much as I personally like to uh, break down societal standards and, and try new stuff and encourage people to be uh, trying new things, it's a massive risk to be the first in mm -hmm. a wave. It's, it's a massive risk to be the 1% of people with electric vehicles assuming that it's going to be okay. I mean, if you told me five years from now, EV vehicles are, are done. The whole thing was just a fad. It didn't work out. I would believe you. I understand that that's a potential future here, right? There are things outside of my control that could go wrong that I, I just have no, I would have no way to predict right now. But it's, it's you know, it's ideological, I guess, but it, it is a future that I'd like to see, that I'd like to see happen. So I'm happy to be supporting it. But yeah, if there's a better way forward, I'd be curious to, to know what it is. Mm -hmm. I like your point about electric motors probably being here to stay. Mm -hmm. Power supply is really the big question, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So since you are, for, for motorcycles, an early adopter, mm -hmm. have you had uh, a lot of people asking you questions or, or talking to you when you're charged, the couple times you've charged? Yeah, it's, it's, I've only had a couple interactions with people that either had never heard of an electric bike or I just had a lot of questions about it. Um, I remember one time 
uh, I was down in Long Beach. I was on my R6 and some guy passed me on an electric bike and it was a really strange experience because I saw him coming up behind me. Bam, he blasts past me and I just heard nothing. And I remember that was the first time I ever saw an electric bike because it was so obvious. It was mm. so obvious. There's no way a bike is going to pass you that fast without there being any noise. And so mm. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure I've, I've uh, uh, provided that uh, uh, experience for lots of people, <laughs> you know. I just, so I, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's um, really noticeable or not. I have noticed how many people um, try to talk to you or will now talk to you while you're on the bike (laughs) in traffic uh, just because that's an option now. You used to be on a bike that's idling and that's loud, but I've had on on a couple occasions now people with their windows open and I'm stopped right next to them and it's just quiet. I mean, we're really, we're just actually this close. There's no noise. So I've had people, you know, start asking me questions like, what is that? You know, what's, Uh what's. And that, that never happened before, or I just didn't notice. Maybe they were trying. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of fun. It's different. I don't know. There are ways in which I, I'm, I'm a performer. I'm a musician. There's ways in which I enjoy the attention. There's ways in which I don't. Um, I don't like to be an inconvenience to people. I didn't like that about having a very loud combustion motor. Mm. Um, well, hey, thank you so much for taking yeah. the time to talk about your experience with your motorcycle so far. Um, I hope I can get uh, maybe Energica to lend, loan me a bike for a few days and maybe we could go for a ride in the mountains or something. That'd be great. I'm sure they would. They've, they've been great. They've been really cool people to, to work with. So yeah, yeah, that'd be great. So yeah, I don't know, maybe look out for a video of uh, riding in the canyons of California. Yeah, um, yeah thank you, Blaine. Cool. And I'm sure we'll we'll probably hear from Blaine or see his bike on something again on this channel because Blaine's a cool dude and he's got a cool bike. So, <laughs> all right. Yeah. Thanks for your time. And cool. uh, thank you guys for watching and listening. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.